I don't know about you, but I'm just so blessed by how the Holy Ghost has directed us during this week and in our, in our teaching. I had no idea that he was going to take us this direction because I came with totally different plans. And uh, so I, I appreciate when something fresh from his heart starts coming out. And, uh, and we're, just, we're just glad to be a part of it. Amen. Uh, turn with me if you would. We're going to kind of pick up where we left off last night. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> and uh, we've been talking about God's definition of prosperity because there are so many people that are in the body of Christ who are givers, but they're disappointed financially, and uh, that ought not be. We want to find out. We want to become skillful with not only giving, but receiving and not only realizing that it's not just about giving and receiving, it's about what you do between the giving and the receiving during that period of time. And, uh, you know, we have to understand this. So many people think a lack of money is a mountain in their life. If they had more money, this problem would disappear. This problem would be dealt with. If we had more money, these things would be solved. But I, I can tell you, every man's mountain is ignorance. It's lack of thinking right. And uh, when we think right, things that we thought were our problem are really not the problem. And uh, so we, we, want the, we know this, that the word helps address that for us. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, it says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Meaning this, God has not assigned us to seek money. It's not our job. We seek what he's doing. We seek his program. We seek what is he promoting. And when we hook up to that, then all that we need is added to help us be successful within his program. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The, the, the place we give God, which is, according to this, to be first. The place we give him affects everything else. When he's first, all is added. When he's not first, everything's affected. And... Uh, the Amplified says, but seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. Notice there's a way to do things. His way of doing and being right, then all these things taken together will be added to you besides we have to have a lifestyle that depicts our nature. This is part of prosperity. This is prosperity hinges on us being true to our nature. We have been made the righteousness of God. Now we have to live in line with that righteousness. Because if we are not living in line with that righteousness, we're not living true to our nature, and no wonder things aren't being added. Amen. Amen. So he tells us our, our primary interest, we are to hook up to what he's doing. Not just on Sunday morning, but in our affections, in our interest, in what is priority to us. We have to have these things first, not just clockwise, but in our heart. They are first. Amen. Because so many are disappointed financially. They give and they give and they give, but yet they still struggle. Well, there's a reason. And I told the story last night, and I want to repeat it again because it's critical when my, for us to understand this, because if you're not careful... Uh, you can hear a phrase that's true, but there are no no preacher can say in every service everything that surrounds a truth. Wow. Right. Right. 
And so people will hear portions of what is said and think that's the totality pertaining to that. That if you give, you get a harvest. Well, there's truth to that, but there's more around that truth. So it's not wrong for the preacher to say, if you give, you get a harvest. <laughs> but the harvest is not automatic. But it is conditional. My, my husband went several years ago, my dad being a farmer in southwest Oklahoma, he was a cotton and wheat farmer. And Ed got in the pickup and went with him to go around as my dad did every day, at least once, but usually twice a day to check all the farms in, his ca in the county because they were spread out. So it took some time to drive around to all the farms. And they got up to, to the farms. And Daddy was known as the best farmer in the county. I mean, by his mid-40s, all of his farms were paid off. And from then on, he paid cash for everything. He owned all of his own tractor equipment. He didn't, he didn't have to, you know, rent people, rent equipment to bring it in. He had it all, and it was lined up, and it was in meticulous condition. And from the time he was in his mid-40s, he, uh, he paid cash for everything. And uh, not because he was born rich. He was so poor growing up that in Oklahoma, he never owned a coat until after he got married. Now, that's poor because we have cold weather there. So I don't want you to think that he got started with an advantage. He was, he was a fine farmer. The greater your skill, the greater your results. That's true spiritually. Now you remember Jesus appeared to my husband and fire shot out of his eyes on one occasion and said, you're not being skillful with the healing anointing. And it displeased him. In that situation specifically, he was displeased with my husband regarding the healing anointing. But generally speaking, he's displeased with, with lack of skill. That would apply to any arena. When we're not skillful, he's not pleased. Why? Because we can't get results. And he can't manifest through ignorance. And if we're not skillful then uh, we paint a bad picture and things that he's wanting to do is, is hindered. Amen. And my dad had great skill and because of it, within 20 years of getting his first farm, all his farms were paid off and he, he paid cash for the next 45 years of his life due to skill. Skill. Now, if we're skillful with the word, just think. Just think, just think what the end result of that is. And so my, my husband was riding with my dad in the pickup, and they drove up to dad's farms. And dad's farms were, he had the, he had the highest cotton. He had the cotton that was the cleanest in the sense of there weren't weeds scattered all throughout. There weren't, it, they weren't half eaten away by pests and things. And... Uh, he, uh, Ed said to my dad, he said, Kenneth, isn't it something? Just plant a seed and you get a harvest. And daddy looked at him like he came from Mars. <laughs> or like he'd just grown a third eye, you know. <laughs> and daddy looked at him and said, that's not true. But if you hear only parts you like to hear <laughs> regarding giving and receiving, you think that's true. All I got to do is plant a seed and I get a harvest, baby. <laughs> It only took a moment for daddy to plant a seed. It only took a moment for him to plant a harvest. That what determined the wealth of that harvest was what was done in the meantime. What was done in the meantime. The, the span of time is the growing season. And my daddy straightened him out real quick. Sowing a seed is part of it. You do get a harvest on what you sow, but your harvest can vary depending on how you treat the seed once it's sown. And uh, so he, Ed got a, a really good education just from this local farmer there. <laughs> Giving doesn't automatically result in prosperity. And people need to understand that. We said this last night. 
giving becomes a spiritual transaction. Not because you're taking money and giving it to the church, but because you're giving out of your heart and you have to release faith. When you attach faith to that action, it becomes a spiritual transaction because faith is a spiritual force. If, it, if you're just going to take money out of your wallet and put it in the bucket and not release faith, that's a financial transaction, but not a spiritual one. So we have to attach our faith to it. And because it's a spiritual transaction, it's a spiritual process. And uh, this harvest thing, this growing of this seed is affected by our spirituality. You can attach your faith to the seed and it becomes a spiritual transaction. Remove your faith and it's no more a spiritual transaction. You can sow it with your faith and then uh, remove your faith and put doubt with it. Amen. So uh, it's important what we do. It's not just about putting money in the bucket and then and now God owes me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Dad Hagen talked about when he was, had, after he had finished his pastoring and started on the road and had such financial difficulties because they weren't provided what they had been provided with as pastors. They weren't provided a parsonage. They weren't provided with congregation members coming and bringing them food all the time. They didn't have a regular income, a weekly income. And so they, he was falling further and further behind. And so Dad Hagen finally set some time to fast and pray and talk to God about the financial situation because they were suffering so much. And uh, he said, he quoted to God, God, your word says if, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. And he said, uh, I want you to know I'm not eating the good of the land. And God said, you don't qualify for that verse. Listen to the word. You don't qualify. Wasn't he a giver of his tithes? Yes. But there's, you have to qualify for some things. He said, you've been obedient, but you've not been willing. Meaning you did what I said, but you didn't want to. You didn't want to do what I said, but you did it. What's this mean? What your heart is doing affects this spiritual transaction of the seed you sowed. You, maybe you sowed it last month, but see, it's a spiritual transaction. And for that spiritual, to bless that seed, then the spiritual within you has to be right because this is, it flowed out of your heart. So your heart has to stay right. Through that growing process of that seed, if I could say it that way. That's why the devil starts working on you after you sowed a seed. He'll work on you before you sowed it, and he'll still work on you after you sowed it. And uh, so God said to Dad Hagen, you don't qualify. So we have to realize that just because we're obedient to do the word, we have to qualify with the word, not just parts of the word. We have to qualify. I was preaching uh, not long after we'd started, well, a couple of years after we started our church, and I had taken several weeks, and I was teaching on prosperity in our church. And God spoke to me, and he said, uh, you're going to have to back up. I mean, I was getting ready to preach on a Sunday morning, about the fourth morning on prosperity. And God said, you're going to have to back up. And I go, what do you mean back up? And he said, until you teach these people how to walk in love in their home, they don't qualify for Bible prosperity. Amen. Meaning, you can sow a seed, but if you don't walk in love, your faith is canceled out. Your seed, something else, a pest came along and ate that seed up, made that seed inoperative. Ed and I, um, we, we have, you know, we were living in a home and 
and God began to uh, deal with me that he had had another home for us. Eight years later, we come across that home. And, uh, well, it's actually six years later, but it was eight years later we got into that home. But when we found that home, uh, the man built it, and the way he built it, he would, him and his wife would live in it for two years to avoid capital gains tax. So they'd build it, live in it for two years, and while they're living in that one, they're building the next one. So they moved every two years. And they built these, I mean, large homes, 8,000 square feet. I mean, they were large on acreage. They were on five-acre lots. And so that's what they did every two years. They just moved. So we saw this home right after they finished building it so it wouldn't become available for another two years. And uh, so I asked Jesus that night, I, at the day I saw it, is that the home? And he came and stood by my chair and talked to me about that home. He said, that's the home. So I knew that was the home. And I won't go into the whole story, but I'll tell you a little bit of it. So it came available. Uh, they put it on the market for sale, and it was at a certain price. And Ed loved not paying full price on a property. He loved that. You know? <clears throat> Listen, uh, to get a good deal is fine, but I'm not going to walk away from the plan of God just because I didn't get the deal I wanted. Now, come on. You have to place more priority on the plan than on the price. Amen. So I knew that was our home. Ed said, I know that's our home. The only thing is, is that they were offering, and this was at the peak of the, the price, uh, you know, the, the, the growth that we had in California. And so everything had just escalated. It was, uh, homes were rising $10,000 a month in value in, in, in California. It was, go, it was just going crazy out there. And we, bought, we sold our home, our previous home. Uh, we, we ended up selling that one at the peak, but we bought this other one at the peak. And so uh, there were people in line wanting this home. And so Ed said, I'm not going to offer him full price. And it wasn't because God had said not to offer. It's because that was his way. I don't, I, you know, I'm going to get me a deal because then he felt like he got the upper hand. You know, I, I, I saw my husband's, you know, pattern. I knew. And so I said, Ed, I said, the man's not going to take a lower price. There's people in line wanting this house. And he's the owner. He doesn't have to take what you offer. It is under his control and command. He said, no, nope, I'm not going to offer full price. I said, well, let me ask you this. Do you agree that's our home? Yes, I agree that's our home. Uh, then, then why won't you pay full price? Because I'm not going to pay full price. I said, then you're not in agreement. Because if you agree, you, t you take whatever step you have to take to come into what you, you agree is ours. No, he said, it's no, that doesn't mean I'm not in agreement. I said, that's exactly what that means. You're not in agreement. And I said, if that's our home, it's not a price issue anymore. It's, is this our home? That's the issue. Because if that's our home, then God has committed himself to the price. Whatever it takes to get it into our hands, if God says that's your home, then he has committed himself to meet whatever demands are connected to that home. So I said, so if you won't pay the price, you're not in agreement that that's the home. Yes, I am. I agree in my heart. I said, you're going to have to agree with your wallet. takes all agreement you know we just you know and so I could only go so far before uh, heavy breathing started as a wife and a, or a husband you know there's a point that we can converse but if that conversation there starts being heavy breathing we have to back off So I was getting, you know, I, I knew, I knew in my heart, the man is not going to come down. He doesn't have to. 
It's at the peak of the market. He doesn't have to. He's not coming down. And uh, Ed won't back up because that's, that was his approach to purchasing something. And so uh, another person came in and put in a full offer. And I told Ed, you know, and it went into escrow with somebody else. And uh, thankfully, right before that happened, I was leading our daily prayer that we had. And uh, the Holy Ghost said to me something. He said, come with me. I want to show you something. And I came up and I was hovering with the Holy Ghost over the table of the owner. I was in their kitchen over their kitchen table and there were two contracts there was our contract and another person's contract and the Holy Ghost said this is the contract to sign speaking to him the owner so I'm thinking I don't care what contract is there they're going to take our contract they took the other contract and so uh, it went into a 60 day escrow well Come, I, and then I realized the Holy Ghost showed me that because it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it looks like. The Holy Ghost said, this is the contract. So in the meantime, we've got our house on the market. And Ed offered it at a certain price. And I said, you're 200000 too low. No, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. No, I'm not. And so he put it on at his price. And got a buyer well in the meantime the house at 60 you know it was a 60 day escrow the one we were wanting uh, the um, the real estate agent dropped dead just dropped dead and it was the owner she owned the real estate company well come to find out she put that house in escrow illegally with her best friends so <clears throat> They went through everything and realized she had done this illegally, so they contacted us. We're the next offer on it. And said, you still want the home? Yeah, I still want the home. And so they said, okay. And the owner told us the price. It was full price. And Ed said, I'm not paying it. I said, then forget the home. Forget the home. Forget it. I'm not, I'm not going to fuss. Just forget it. And, uh, but make a long story short, uh, the day we, Ed said, uh, the day it came available, the home we were selling fell out of escrow. So we can't buy this one till that one. Now, Ed says, Nassim, the home fell out of escrow. I said, you know why? God's giving you another opportunity to reprice it. It's not a bad, it's not a negative. God's trying to get us. So we raised the price. I said, just, just, just trust me. Just do this. Just do this. <laughs> Raise the price 200000 Just do it. I said, you can always lower it. But just raise it. Now that it's fallen out of escrow, raise the price. Put it back on the market. He did. The next day, we got a cash buyer. And I said, now, there's your 200000 You didn't want to pay on the house we're buying. See, God... God made it up. Yeah. Now, when we were talking about all this, though, earlier before that happened, and we ended up with the home. But before we did all this, while we were talking about it, and I said, you're not in agreement if you're not agreeing with the price. He said, no, I'm in agreement that you're home. I just don't agree with the price. I said, then you're not in agreement. <laughs> and there we went back and forth, and we kept, no, I'm in agreement that you're home. Then you're not in agreement. If you won't pay what it costs to get the home. You don't get to set the price, Ed. <laughs> you can set what you offer, but the owner gets to set what he takes. Right? So I, I, I knew this. Faith worketh by love. I can sow seeds for my home. But if I'm not going to work by, if I'm not going to walk by love... I'm going to destroy the seed I sowed. There will not be a harvest on that. So I knew this. I got to back off. I've got to back off. Why? Because if I want a harvest, I can't mistreat my seed by destroying it with strife. You can plant your seed, and if you get in strife, it's like going over and pouring arsenic on that thing. 
It's poison to your seed. And I knew if I get in strife and start pushing my issue, it doesn't matter that Jesus came and talked to me about it. It doesn't matter. I can't win through strife. And I had to back off. I had to back off. And I said to God, I said, God, I said, you've talked to me about that home. I know that's our home. And I said, I trust you to make it clear to him. Let's talk to him. So he gets on the road. Two days later, he calls me and says, okay, go, we'll offer the price for the home. He said, God told me I'm, I'm not in agreement. And I said, mm. <laughs> You see, if I want my faith to work, I can't step out of love. This is why so many think that they can sow a seed Sunday, talk any way they want to their spouse, and then think they're going to get a harvest. No, you're not, because what you do during the growing season will determine what the harvest is going to be. It's not just the seed that determines it, what you, how you treat the seed. Because my dad realized he could plant a great seed. He could water it, but if he didn't keep the pest off of it. Water pest. Unforgiveness. Bitterness. Strife. Offense. Talking doubt. All, kind, all the sins of the mouth. Amen. The place you go on Friday night will show up on your seed. Because your seed's growing. Who you date. The websites you look at. Doesn't matter who, it, does, it doesn't matter who saw you or who didn't see you. Your spiritual transaction is, is affected by your spiritual life. You cannot separate your wallet from your lifestyle. Can't do it. There is an invisible thread. That se you can't separate your wallet from your lifestyle, and you can't separate your seed from your lifestyle. It's all affected. And this is why a lot of people are just given and given, and they're disappointed in their harvest because they don't know how to treat their seed while it's growing. They don't know how to live their life while it's growing. Amen. Because if it's just plant a seed and you get a harvest, we all got it made. It's not just plant a seed and we all get a harvest. No. No, because prosperity is not automatic. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Offerings that we give to God must be received by him. Uh, go with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And I let's start in verse 3. Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. It says this, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the priests. Are we not called kings and priests unto him? Mm -hmm. He will purify the priests, the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver. Look at this, that they may offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Offer it in righteousness. Offer it in righteousness. We have been made righteous in Christ, but our lifestyle has to line up with who we are in Christ. Because we can offer something and not be right in how we're living, and he doesn't have to accept that offering. He accepts what's offered in righteousness. That means our motives have to be right. Our intents have to be right. 
Why? To get a full harvest on this. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 So that, notice this. We have to purify. Then our sacrifices are accepted. Our offerings are accepted. Living, living lives of purity. Can I tell you this? We're made righteous, but we're not left to willpower to live righteous. We are enabled by his strength and his grace to live this life. So it's not that he's putting unreasonable demands and it's not works because it's not by our works that we're living it. It's by his power we're living it. So people will say, well, that's works to try to get something from God. No, it's not. It's called, it's called living true to your nature. And we have his power, his spirit to help us live the life of righteousness he has made ours. But if we're going to choose a different lifestyle and then try to offer him something and say we want to harvest on it, it has to be received. And it's received once it's given in righteousness. In righteousness. Offerings in righteousness. Not offerings outside of righteousness. We have to be walking in our righteousness. Well, go over 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, 24. We all know this is a healing verse, right? We should. It says this, Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin. We're dead to sin. Meaning this, sin has lost its dominion over us. It no longer rules and reigns over us. We're not subject to it as slaves. We are fully empowered to say, no, not doing it again. Not living that way anymore. And when you say that, you're empowered. Listen, we have to keep our mind and our flesh under by faith. You have to use your faith. Amen. You have to. But it is employing his grace that enables us to live the life he has made us to live. So it says, his own, in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, look at this, hmm, should live unto righteousness. Hmm, should live. He's telling us how we should live. Now that we're free from sin, this is the way you should live. Not optional, this way you should live. Now, by whose stripes ye were healed. Notice what's in between freed. Now, see, he dealt. The thing is, the first phrase shows us he dealt with the sin problem. Therefore, the sickness problem is dealt with. See, sickness came in because of sin. So you deal with the sin problem. You've dealt with the sickness problem. Okay? So he talks, he talks about now you're free from sin. He also bore your sickness, but what's sandwiched in between? Before you arrive at this health that's yours, there's a way you should live. This is why a lot of Christians are sick. They're not living as they should. They're not living as they should. Doesn't healing belong to us? Yes, but it's conditional on how we should live. That's why many are not, even though, they're de- even though they're free from the power of sin, they don't arrive at sickness because they miss the second thing of how you should live. In, should live righteousness. Righteousness. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Verse 32, go with me. And I'm going to read out of the Amplified. So if you able, pull up an Amplified translation. Acts 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, now who's writing this? To the New Testament church, right? 
And now, brethren, I commit you to God. I deposit you in his charge, entrusting you to his protection and care. So notice this as their spiritual voice in their life. He had a measure of it that God and took away from him, that God, uh, if I could say this, assigned over to Paul. So he says, now I'm leaving, so now this goes back to God. Isn't that your pastor has more uh, ability over your life than you ever realized? I deposit you in his charge and trusting you to his protection and care. Why? Because under him, they were affected by Paul here. Now look what he says. And I commend you to the word of his grace. To the commands, ah, God doesn't ask, he commands. He doesn't ask his children, he commands. To the commands and counsels and promises of his unmerited favor. It, talking about the word, is able to build you up and to give you your rightful inheritance among all God's set-apart ones inheritance among all God's set apart ones those consecrated purified transformed of soul what's transformed of soul? renewed mind don't be conformed but be transformed transformed soul so notice this we don't partake of our inheritance without a commitment to being consecrated purified and transformed in our souls and this is why so many people are trying to get the inheritance of prosperity by planting a seed without a commitment to purity consecration being sanctified being set apart and then wondering then they're disappointed in all they're giving but not receiving because what you do during that growing season of the seed is you purify you consecrate you sanctify. Amen. And what, what was consecration in a previous season of your life? As you grow and develop, you have to come into a whole other level of consecration, sanctification. You might have gotten a good harvest on a seed you sowed 10 years ago living at one level of... But once you come into a whole other level of, of, of knowledge of the Word of God... He's upping what he expects out of our consecration, out of our purity, out of our sanctification. All these like words. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Isn't that what it says? It is able to build you up and to give you rightful inheritance among all God's set apart ones, those consecrated, purified, and transformed a soul. Some uh, Pastor Jay, would you turn to Second Timothy chapter two? And I want to say I don't know if it's around verse twenty. You know when he's talking about uh, vessels of gold or silver or wood or um, um I don't know if I want the King James or not. Yeah, no, I, no, I want the Amplified is what I'd like if you could. Uh huh. Okay. Now I'm going to start. Um, yes, it is amplified. I'm going to start in verse 19. But the firm foundation of laid by God stands sure and unshaken, bearing this seal, this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names himself by the name of the Lord. So that's us. Give up. Give up all iniquity and stand aloof from it. Yes. Verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also utensils of wood and earthenware, and some for honorable and noble use, and some for menial and ignoble use. Yes. Verse 21, so whoever cleanses himself. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So notice this, this stuff isn't automatic. Just because you've been made the righteousness of God doesn't mean that this is being lived out 
in your lifestyle. Whoever cleanses himself from what is ignoble and unclean, who separates himself from contact with contaminating and corrupting influences. You must separate yourself from what will contaminate because it will contaminate your seed sown. It won't, just, it won't just contaminate your mind. It will contaminate your spiritual life, and you have you, and it only becomes a spiritual transaction when you sow your seed, right? Amen. By using your faith. If your faith gets affected, everything your faith was on gets affected. Amen. Who separates himself from contact with contaminating and corrupting influences will then himself be a vessel set apart and useful for honorable and noble purposes, consecrated and profitable to the master, fit and ready for any good work. Notice this. These are all part of God's household. The wooden, the wooden vessels, the ones that are used for menial tasks. You don't lose your, con you don't lose your salvation if you're not going to live clean. But you're just not usable. Your, us your usability is different. And God's not the one that determines how much he uses you. You do. Amen? Amen? Every one of us are vessels. That's what he's saying. We're all a vessel. And we determine the quality of our vessel, not him. We determine the condition of our vessel. You know, they take us in the back room and they offer us some beautiful... I mean, really nice food. I mean, really, really beautiful food. Really beautiful food. I'm impressed because I don't cook, so anything that's beautiful. What would I think if they pulled out a plate that was used last Sunday and they didn't have time to clean? And it's got food dried on, and they try to put this beautiful meal and they offer it to me I go I see worms <laughs> I see green fuzz you know I see things but the food is good but the food is good the food may be good but the vessel affected the vessel affected it your seed may be good you understand your seed may be good but the vessel that took that seed to church and handled it, put it in. It's a contaminating, corrupting influence when it's not separated from wrong things. And then people, I, I, I so appreciate the preaching that we hear in prosperity, but you better know there's a lot that surrounds it. Why? Why? Norville Hayes made this statement. Not many people are big enough for big money. Now, what does he mean? He's talking about their insides. Their insides. How do we receive big harvest? Get big enough inside. Get big enough inside. How do we get big enough inside? Stay away from contaminating, corrupting influences. Anything that is not going to accelerate us and bless us in our race, we need to leave it behind. And sometimes, and you start getting to the level of having been in the ministry as long as we've been in, it's not even wrong things that will, that will, that will hinder and hold back. It's just things that should not be given the, the place. It's just distractions. Distractions will make your vessel uh, unusable. Amen. Praise the Lord. So uh, it matters how we live once we put our seed in. It matters what we say about our pastor. It matters what we say about people. It just matters. Why? Because our sowing is a spiritual transaction. Therefore, every part of our spiritual life flows to that seed. It's going to either water it. It's going to either uh, put... It's, it's, it's going to be able, if, if we're living right, when pests come, it can't, it can't touch our seed. When offense comes, we say, oh, no, you don't. You're not getting my seed. You thought it was just after your marriage. No, it's after everything. I tell you, 
offense will cost you more than a relationship. It will cost you the funding for your future. You have to realize your giving is a spiritual transaction. Therefore, your spiritual life, it's, it's an invisible cord to that everything that's at, everything you've sown because it's a spiritual transaction you're giving. Amen. Now, uh, I, I could spend a lot of time, and for time's sake, I don't want to. Joshua chapter 1, go with me if you would. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. How do we have success financially? Well, Joshua chapter 1 in chapter one verse 8 is the prescription for success. It's a prescription for success. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, so thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Prosperity and success. Prosperity and success is affected by what came before that. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You have to keep the word in your mouth. You have to meditate on it so that you do it. The saying, the meditating, the doing will arrive you at prosperity and success. So notice the doing. The doing. What you doing? What are you doing on Friday night? What are you doing? <laughs> Well, you know what you're doing? What you meditated on. Number two. What, what, what did you let your mind think about? Okay. Let me put it this way. That verse is this. The doing needs to be directed by the Holy Ghost. This is where a lot of people miss it in their faith life, is they want to have an act of faith, so they grab a random act of faith. You, ne you need to have the Holy Ghost directing your acts. You know, you see somebody do an act of faith and get a great harvest on it, and you go do it. No, no, no. It, it works because the Spirit directs it. Amen. That's why. It, that's when it works. <clears throat> but let me say it to you this way. Have you ever seen an old movie? And uh, they had those, what, the first, the first forms of old rifles, maybe, I don't know, what are they called, a musket or something? You know, they're, they're not those, auto, those automatic things. Brrr, you know, what was that? You got one shot. And there's a whole troop coming at you. You got one shot, baby, and you're fumbling trying to get that thing loaded. What, what do they do? They pour gunpowder, then they pour a bullet, and then they put a paper wad, right? That's called uh, putting the word in your mouth. That's number one of Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You are loading your gun. You're putting in the gunpowder, you're putting in the bullet, then you put in the wad. You've loaded it. Can you shoot it? Yeah, yeah but you're not going to be accurate. Why? you got to pack it. They take a rod and they pack that down. That's step two. That's the meditation. You're packing that down into your spirit. That word you're saying, you're packing it into your spirit so that it becomes one with you. It becomes a living thing with you. It becomes alive. It's not just words on a, on a page anymore. It's yours. You're packing it down into your thought life, into your attention, and into your spirit. You're packing it. Pack it, pack it, pack it, pack it. Why do you have to pack it? Because accuracy is, co is connected to the packing of, this, of, that, of that bullet and that gunpowder. And then you pull the you put come up. Now you're ready to act, yeah. baby. Don't just do a random thing. You don't got one shot. All of that saying yeah. and all of that meditating doesn't give you shot after shot after shot after shot. You can't afford to be missing shots. Your finances and your health depends on accuracy, and the accuracy comes when you follow the leading of the spirit. Amen. He'll tell you, get over there. Yeah. Aim at that, yeah. right? Yeah. The doing is the pulling of the trigger. Yeah. So many faith people are walking around doing. Don't, it's like the kid guns that we can get down at Target. Yeah. Click, 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 and there's nothing in it. 
It takes time to load that to load the gun in your mouth. It takes time to pat down that which you've loaded in your mouth down into your heart, into your spirit, into your thinking, into your attention. It takes time. You can't just walk up, throw a seed in, and think, I'm going to get this big old harvest. You have to take, to arrive at success, you have to do the prescription for success. The word has to be in your mouth, it has to be in your meditations, and it has to be in you the way you act. God is not a get-rich-quick scheme God. You can't just throw a seed in the ground and I come back rich. He's not just filling a bank account. He's building a man. He's building your life. There's so much connected to this. And it's not hard. It's just give yourself. It, you know, really, really, if we'll just if we'll focus on Joshua 1, verse 8, it'll fulfill every other thing. It'll fulfill every other thing. If you just get the word in, you get a word in, you get it, get it in your mouth, get it in your attention. Meditation means getting it in your attention, getting it in your thoughts. Because it doesn't matter that it's in your mouth. If you don't think faith, you don't got it. You have to think faith. Now, faith doesn't come out of your thought life. The faith is in your spirit, but it still has to be in your thought life. The word has to be in your thought life. It has to be in your thought life. It's not enough because there's... Haven't you heard people that know the right... They know the faith lingo, but it sounds hollow when they say it. Why? It's not packed in through meditation. Meditation makes it a living thing in your life. And it takes time. Amen. It gets people big enough for big money. Now, in time harvest, in time harvest, the, the, the wealth of the sinner laid up for the just. We better be big enough for it. We better be big enough inside for it. Amen? Well, praise the Lord. Then, then we'll close with this, I think. Mark chapter 4. Go with me if you would. Mark chapter 4. And if I can just breeze through these last steps real quickly. You're, you're sowing and reaping in all this process here of giving and prosperity. First of all, we talked about last night, you have to find good ground. Don't just be throwing your seed anywhere. Where is the best ground, the place where God's hooked up your life? Don't just, you know... That's the first place to give. You can give to other places. You know, I one, one little gal that, you know, a young young gal newer in the things of the Lord was telling me, uh, you know, she said, oh, I was driving by, you know, a homeless person on the corner, and I had to stop and give him money. And you could tell that she got it worked up in her emotions over it. And you know, it's, it's, it's fine to give to the poor. Absolutely fine. But I said, honey, I, I said, let me tell you something. Don't you dare give to the people on the corner till you've given your tithe to the church. Amen. Amen. Because that will never substitute for obedience to God. So don't relieve. Because I said many people are giving to those people to get relief for the way they're living. They're trying to appease their conscience for how they live. But I said that's not us. We direct. We know exactly where we are to shoot. Where, where we're to sow our seed. We're, we're purposeful in our sowing. We're not just dropping it anywhere. So make sh that's fine if you want to give in those places. That's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's scriptural. But first things first. Amen. So you have to know this. Uh, to, to have prosperity, number one, you have to know how to sow. How to sow. There's a right way to put a seed in the ground. The, the, the dirt has to be prepared. My dad would, would mix in the minerals and everything else into the ground before he ever sowed. So to know this, to know how to sow, number one, you have to obey the word. When he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, you have to know that. You have to know what the word says about it. Number two, you have to follow the spirit in your sowing because he'll direct you in, thing, in ways you never thought you would... I, I, I wouldn't give to that of my own, but God can direct you. 
So you have to follow the Spirit in your sowing. The third thing, you have to release your faith. Amen. When you give, don't just put it in the bucket. You have to say something. Amen. Number four, you have to be glad to do it. Yes. You have to give cheerfully. Yes. Cheerfully. Yes. Amen. Amen. Otherwise, your sowing misses the target. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So... Then the, the second thing, the sowing, the second thing is the tending to the seed. This is what so many leave out. They yeah. don't talk about the tending right. to the seed. Right. My dad didn't just plant a seed and then walk out and come back a few months later with a, you know, with a combine. Right. My dad checked the seed every day. Yes. Every day yes. he tended to the seed. Can I tell you this? Once you sow the seed, the real work begins. Yeah. People think the real work is sowing and harvesting. No, the real work is in the tending. That's when the work begins. Why? Because every day you've got to pay attention to your life. Every day you've got to pay attention to your walk with God. Every day you have to pay attention to the Word. The real work begins once it's sown. Amen? Now, if we read through and you, if we go over to Mark chapter 4 and verse 14... It's talking about the parable of the sower sows the word, right? When Jesus was talking about sowing the seed of the word. Well, wouldn't that absolutely parallel sowing a financial seed? You're sowing a financial seed. What destroys the seed of the word? What accelerates it or what hinders it? Well, just let's read real quickly the Amplified Translation. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. The sower sows the word. The one along the path are those who... Now, I'm just doing the description part, not the, not the first, the parable part, but the, this is the part when he was breaking it down to the disciples. The ones along the path are those who have the word sown in their hearts, but when they hear, Satan comes at once and by force takes away the message which is sown in them. So, uh, so notice this. Anytime you sow, Satan's going to show up. When you sow a financial seed, he's going to show up. Why? He wants to interfere with that seed. He wants to interfere with the way you think, the way you talk, the way you behave. He wants to affect you somehow. So just know that. That's, that's going to happen. Verse 16, And in the same way, the ones sown along stony ground are those when they hear the word at once receive and accept and welcome it with joy, and they have no real root in them. So they endure for, endure for a little while. See, uh, you, have to, you have to make sure that your, as, as it says in Joshua chapter 1, saying the word, meditating on. Why? Because that puts roots in you. It, it gives you some depth of soil. And roots can go down and grow. Amen? Amen? And so they endure for a little while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word. Can we say when trouble or persecution arises on the count of sowing? Yeah. 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 Devil will, yeah. 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 They immediately are offended. Ah, so offense is an enemy to the seed, right? Yeah. If it's an enemy to the seed of the word, it's an enemy to the seed of your finances. Yeah. And they become displeased indignant, resentful, and they stumble and fall away. Offense will destroy every piece of, every, every seed you've ever sown. And the ones sown among the thorns are others who hear the word. But now you've heard the word. <laughs> Verse 19, then the cares, the anxieties of the world, the distractions of the age, and the pleasure and the delight of false glamour and deceitfulness of riches and the craving and passionate desire for other things creep in and choke and suffocate the word and it becomes fruitless. What's that mean? The word, the kingdom's no longer first to you. Your interests, your hobbies, your cares, your worries, you're putting something else first. So if we just, if we seek, just, just keep the kingdom first. Just keep the kingdom first. And then we're not, we're not offering up our seed on the altar of our distractions. and Other things creeping in, cares and anxieties. If we just keep the kingdom first. Verse 20, and those sown on the good, well-adapted soil are the ones who hear the word, receive, accept, welcome, and bear fruit. Some 30 times as much as sown, some 60 times as much, and some even 100 times as much. 
We want to grow to be 100-fold hundred, hundred ground, but not everyone's there. But that's where we're headed. That's our standard. That's our standard. Amen. So these are all things we have to pay attention to in the tending. Plus what we talked about last night about purifying and what we said earlier about being consecrated and set apart and all these things. Then the third thing is how to reap. People don't know how to reap. Can I tell you how you're going to reap? You've got to listen to the Holy Ghost or you'll never know how to reap. He'll tell you when to put in the sickle, so to speak. We have to be led by the Spirit, not only in our sowing, but in our reaping. Amen. Jesus told Dad Hagen, if you learn to follow my Spirit, I will make you rich. Why? Because the Spirit will direct you in what you sow. He'll direct you in any part of the tending season. Yes, yes, yes. You deal with that, honey. Don't deal with that marriage problem, honey. Quit, to, quit doing that. The Holy Ghost will point out the specifics of life that will injure the seed during the growing season. Yes, yes. Amen. Then the Holy Ghost will also direct you how to reap the harvest yes. on the seed you've sown. When he said to me uh, in February of 2014, he said, I'm going to give you Amy Silk McPherson's home. What's he doing? He's directing me where my harvest is. That's a harvest for me. That's a harvest for me. See, I didn't just pick up and get in my car and go drive around and look for any old house. I followed his direction. He will direct you. And when you follow his direction, he'll make you rich. Amen. You're not left to sow alone. You have the, the, the counsel of the Spirit and the Word. You're not left to, to tend to, the, to yourself during the growing season alone. Look to the Word and the Holy Spirit to help you. And number three, look to the Holy Spirit when it comes to harvesting. Amen? But I'll tell you this, just like you had to sow in faith, you reap in faith. The harvest will not show up automatically. It will show up. You have to release faith. You have to release faith to harvest what you've sown. When my dad, after he sowed his seed, he didn't just sit back and wait for it to show up in the barn. He put forth effort to sow it. He put forth effort to tend to it. Then he put forth effort to harvest it. Faith is called for at the sowing, at the tending, and at the harvesting. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now know this, if we're going to prosper, Psalms 141 verse 8 says this, But my eyes are toward you, O God the Lord. In you do I trust and take refuge. Now notice this. If you ever start looking at your seed, you're not going to get the harvest you should have gotten. God's the provider. He just asks you to sow something so he can cause it to grow. I, I sow, but I look at him. You can't look at him and look at your business at the same time. You can't look at him and look at and start calculating and planning what, how I'm going to make this happen and how I'm going. You better keep your eyes on him, how he's going to do it. When he told me that he was going to give me Sister Amy's castle six and a half million dollars in debt, I mean, I was in the height of having to finish the eight projects that Ed had gotten partially done and we we were finishing those if i would have looked at anything here i would have never ended up with that house when he said i'm going to give it to you i had to keep looking at him to get all this finished to get all this handled it matters where you're looking when you're sowing when you're tending and when you're harvesting our eyes are on him I said, our eyes are on him. Do you know pastors have to know if God says something, you can't look at the congregation and their giving of, of whether you can have what God said? Our eyes are on him. 
during this whole process, and this is where a lot of people miss it, they are looking at, at down here. They're looking at, well, maybe they're going to give me money. Well, maybe they're going to give me money. I love something Pastor Noel said once. He said, because the word says, uh, God, God spoke and said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Or my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Meaning this, he's not saying I'm so much better than you. He's saying come up. There's an invitation to come up knowing that we think too low. But notice this, he said, because his thoughts are, our thoughts are not his, his thoughts are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. And, and Pastor Noel said this, if you thought of it, he can't use it. So many people are thinking, how can I make, how they're planning. He's not going to take your thoughts and make them his. That means we're looking at him. We get our thoughts from him. He's not taking direction from us. Amen. He's not, he's not taking counsel from us. When you're perfect, you don't listen to what's imperfect. You don't need to. Hallelujah. And this is why a lot of people aren't prospering. They are just... Their, 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 their vision isn't fixed on the right thing. Amen. Tend to your seed, but focus on him. Sow your seed. Tend to your seed. Harvest your seed, but he's the focus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, are you helped tonight? Don't go home and say, oh, I'm not this, I'm not this, I don't, don't do this. Look to the Holy Ghost to help you say, what should, be, what should I be emphasizing right now? In this season of my life, what is this season calling for out of my life? And focus on that. Amen? Because like I said, this is not, we're not doing this by willpower. We're not doing this by human effort. We have his divine grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to quit turning everything into a money issue. Because so many people are so fixated on money. Money, money. Cost, what's it cost? What's it cost? So what, what's God say? What's God say? Remember what Jehoshaphat, he said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on thee. And when he put his eyes and the whole congregation, the whole nation turned Godward. They all, because he gathered them together, they all turned Godward. They had no idea that by turning Godward, they would end up with carrying three days worth of spoils out. Where they looked determined their wealth. Not only their victory, it determined their wealth. Amen. Aren't you glad he gives us a better place to look? Don't be impressed by your sowing. That you're so fixed on it. Well, bless God, I give tithes. You better get your eyes off you. Amen. Amen. If it weren't for him, none of us would be doing nothing. Amen. Stand with me to your feet tonight. Father, we're so grateful for your word. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. Father, we're so, so grateful. Thank you for bringing us into the light. Thank you, Father, for helping, helping us in our thinking. You are so limitless. And we thank you for helping us remove the ceilings and the limits off of, off of our thinking, off of our, off of our words. And Father, we know this, money issues are not money issues. <laughs> We put you first. First and foremost, you're everything to us. You are everything to us. And Father, it is, it's not difficult. It's not complicated. You've made us righteous. So we choose to live the life you authored for us. To live righteous. Think in terms of righteousness. So in terms of righteousness. That's who we are. In Christ, we are made righteous. So we, we refuse to live 
less than what we've been made. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Father, we thank you for answers. And uh, those answers can look a little bit differently for each one of us tonight regarding, uh, based on what each one of us are facing. But we're so grateful no matter what we face, we always have our answer. We always have our help. We thank you, Father. And Father, I speak, I speak prosperity over the people, blessing over the people, your best over this congregation. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it. We receive it. We accept it. We just simply put you first in everything we do. We value your word. We get it in us. We hold to it. And we let it govern the actions of our lives. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, on the last night of services when I'm in a series of meetings, I always want to minister to those who uh, may, need, may need healing. And uh, we... Uh, ministered the other night by word of knowledge regarding some healings but if you're here and you want hands laid on you for some kind of physical condition we want to take the time to minister to you amen hallelujah so if you're here and you say pastor nancy i want hands laid on me for healing raise up your hands if you would just real high so i can see how many we're going to be okay if you would those on this side come on up and line up up front if you would <coughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Congregation, reach your hands out this way. Reach your hands out this way. Father, we're so grateful. We're so, so grateful for the fullness that you've made ours. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for our healing. Those of you that are up here and those of you who are going to be in the line, and let's all just do it together. Let's just raise up our hands and worship him as our healer. Jesus, we worship you. Thank you for the price you paid for us. Thank you for the price... You paid for our wholeness, our healing, so that we could be whole. We honor that price. We honor that price tonight. And one way we honor it is by receiving it, agreeing with your word and receiving of that healing power. We worship you, our healer. We worship you. We worship you tonight. We're so grateful. We're so thankful. We're so, so thankful. So say this with me, those of you that will have hands laid on you tonight, whether you're up here yet or not, say this. When hands are laid on me, the healing power of God will go into my body. It'll drive out pain and symptoms, sickness and disease, and I shall be whole. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, for that healing power that goes in and makes whole. Be healed in Jesus' name. 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 Hallelujah. Now this side to my left and your right, if you want hands laid on you for healing, come up here real quickly if you would. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 
Father, we thank you for that healing anointing that can be stored and transmitted into the bodies of those who are not even present. And we say that as these claws are laid upon their bodies, that they shall be whole. It will drive out pain and symptoms, sickness and disease, and they shall be whole. And if there is a presence of an evil spirit, it will drive it out in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Be whole in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Be healed in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Father. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Now this middle section, if you want hands laid on you, come on up. We thank you, Father. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Just step up a little closer to me. Thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you whole in Jesus' name. We thank you. Be healed in Jesus' name. 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 Healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know what this pertains to, love, but something, if there's some tweaking to happen in, in your thinking, and I don't know if it has to do with physical. I don't, it doesn't seem to me. But uh, maybe it is. But there's something, some tweaking in your thinking. And when you make that adjustment, things will start clicking. Hallelujah. He'll show you what that is. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Be healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. Now, I, I know that Pastor Jay ministered to you and your wife the other day. My, 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 that's so critical. I don't remember everything he said, so I'll let you go back and recapture that. But everything, because there's a trap set up by that devil ahead if that doesn't come into God's best. And I don't know what all that means. It's so critical for you. But aren't you glad you know the remedy? Yeah. It's so it's such a blessing to have the clarity. Yeah. It's such a blessing. But I'm just saying this what the devil intended to accelerate and expound and make things, if I could say this, almost seem like they're out of control. And I don't know what regards that is, but hallelujah. Come here. Father, we thank you for we thank you for an increase of the healing anointing. Uh, we thank you for an in uh, mm -mm. We thank you for an increase of it upon their lives and ministry. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for an increase of that he uh, an increase of that healing anointing. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We thank you for an increase of that healing anointing. We thank you for it. 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 We thank you for it, Father, for an increase. For an increase of that healing anointing. Increase of the healing anointing upon them. An increase. We thank you, Father, for an increase. Give me your hand, brother. An increase of that healing anointing. Uh, mm. uh, uh, we thank you for it, Father. Mm. We thank you for it, Father. 
We thank you for it. Uh, uh, <laughs> and the compassion, the compassion that will flow out of you towards someone. You'll just see them. And I mean, it'll be like tears will well up in your eyes. That's not emotions, that's compassion. And there's a different, and as you let that, as you let that compassion flow out, it'll, it'll flow out and do a work in them. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you for an increase in the healing anointing, an increase in the, he, in the healing anointing. We thank you for it, Father. We praise you. Now let's thank him tonight. That healing power is working in us. We thank you that it's working in us. We thank you that it's working in us. From the top of our head to the soles of our feet, it's working in us. It's working, it's working, it's working, it's working in us. It's working in us. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Now this comes up in my heart. The, the things that have been spoken in the three services I've done regarding prosperity and, 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 and giving and sowing and reaping, uh, he's also authored things in you, but they need to be finished. It, he's the author and the finisher. What's it mean by finished? It means is it's flowing as, a, as an evident work and bearing fruit in your life. And he wants you to be a work thoroughly furnished. So what this means, meditate on the things that, that seem to land in you particularly. Meditate on those. Don't just walk out and leave it in the building during camp meet. But after you go, you're going to have to call up those things that stood out to you. And different things will stand out to different people based on where your need is at that point. But uh, meditate on those. Let them go around and around and around on the inside. You speak it, hold to it, honor it. And it will it will bring it will bring this congregation up to where it's going to need to flow in amen hallelujah hallelujah father we thank you for that 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 i i would i i make it a point when i'm like in in certain meetings that i attend i don't get to attend a lot of different meetings that i'm not preaching in but I, I write down, and I've taught our congregation, there should be a homework assignment out of every service. What are you addressing that in your own life that, that the Spirit prompted or highlighted to you or said to you? You need to write those things down, those things, and keep them in front of you and dig further. Keep, keep digging further. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We give you glory and honor. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. Listen, I don't want your prosperity to look like your region. You know what I'm saying? Just because you live in a region, that does not have to be the scope of your prosperity. Isaac was going to go into Egypt in a time of famine. God said, don't go to Egypt. Don't go there. And he says, you sow here. In a time of famine, he sowed and received a hundredfold in the famine. Why? Because he was not limited to the condition of the region. You're not limited to don't don't be limited 
by the area you were raised, by the profession you're in. Take, allow the limits to come off because God can. What was that? You know, Joseph. I mean, it the, with the dreams. Remember that he in, he interpreted for the for the Pharaoh. What was it? Seven years of fat cow. Seven years of skinny cow coming and eating up. But, and because he had a divine idea and divine wisdom that was given him, Egypt was exempt because a man heard from God. Fat cows and skinny cows are going to happen in the world, but we can seek an exemption. Why? By just obeying what the Spirit says. Obey what the obey the Word. Obey the Spirit, and we get an exemption from what goes on. Amen. You know, it talks about in the you know in the latter days that children will be rebellious against parents. Not mine. We're exempt. Why? Because I teach my kids. I don't I don't put in my kids what the world's putting in their kids. We're exempt as we walk in the light of the word and obey him. We become exempt from what goes on around us. You need to see yourself as exempt from the limitations of your region, the limitations of professions, the limitations of education, the limitations of lack of education. Why? Because the word breaks barriers. But it has to break them up here. Why not you? Why not you? Why not you? Why not you? Why not have your dream home? Why not? Why just why just hold it as a dream? How do you how do you break the limits off? Well, Joshua one eight. Put it in your mouth, meditate on it, and then follow the Holy Ghost in carrying it out. Amen. Amen. We have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. The abundance of heaven is our flow. But it has to be our flow in our thought life too. Amen. So things that things that stood out to you, make sure you soak in those. Soak in those. Soak in those. Quit being cheap. You're not out looking for a deal, a sale, a bargain. A... If, they, if you get them, that's fine. But that's not your motivation. You know, when I, when, when I travel at different times, pastors will, say, pastors will say to me, what's gas cost in your city? I have no idea. I don't look. Why? Because I need it and I'm getting it. And I don't drive down half a block. Or cross town and get in a line of 20 cars to save three cents a gallon. I mean, it's like, come on, come on. I'm not talking about being wasteful, but I'm not led by things that... If, if we're tripping over three cents a gallon, baby, we've got bigger problems than we know. That means you, husbands, y'all go home and say, honey, everything that's in your heart, let's believe for it. And wives say to your husbands, honey, everything that's in your heart, let's believe for it. But you can't force someone and demand that they give you something. Let's believe for it. Amen. 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 Don't put something hard to bear on your marriage. By saying, bless God, I want this house. Well, honey, uh, I'd struggle. Well, no, let's believe for it. Let's not put a demand on one another for it. I'm just saying where God wants this body to go, we take the limits off. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. Testing, test. On. Can you hear me? There you go. Amen. <clears throat> Um, I was 
in the back table a couple of times. I, was, it, I wanted to tell a story. It kept coming up in my spirit, and we got to talking about other things that never came up, and I realized now why it kept coming up. It's for you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about compassion. She ministered to you about compassion. <clears throat> Every time that has come on me, that compassion she was talking about, the people were healed completely. Mm -hmm. I had a situation, a young, uh, Finley, Ohio, I believe it was, a young boy. Parents brought up, he was seven, I believe. No, he was nine. But he had not grown physically for two years because of, I, they, they weren't quite sure. Something had stopped, some part of his brain had stopped growing, or I, I forget what had happened. It maybe had died or something. I don't remember all the details. And that compassion came on me. I gathered him up in my hands, just weep, uh, my arms just weeping over him. And uh, they, uh, of course, we, the, we, we were guest ministers, so we left. Two weeks later, the pastor sent us a letter and said, he's because oh, I got to say the rest of it. He had in school, he had not been learning. He had not been growing. He, he couldn't learn anymore. He had stopped learning. Physically, he had stopped growing. So there was two things going on, physically and mentally. He wasn't learning, and then he wasn't growing physically. Two weeks later, the pastor sent us a letter and said, I want you to know that boy has already caught up to where he's supposed to be physically, and he has already caught up to where he's supposed to be in school. That's that flow of compassion. Hallelujah. Father, I agree that that, as they yield to that, miracles, miracles, miracles in their church. Amen. Praise God. I just knew not, I knew why I was prompted to tell that story. That's so good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Have we been blessed this week? Been so, so blessed. Thank you, Pastor Nancy, for taking the time, pouring out your heart, and, uh, being willing to be away from your family and just being here to feed us. It's, it's rich, 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 rich. Thank you, Pastor Ike, for coming all the way from Nigeria. Amen. And, and coming and blessing us. You blessed us richly. And the Ramoses, thank you, guys. They are such a supply to our lives. You have no idea. Uh, we love them dearly. And... Uh, <laughs> You have, you have no idea the inside joke on that. But, <laughs> but thank you for taking the time and, and helping Pastor Nancy and being on the road away from your grandchildren and being out here obeying God. You bless us by blessing Pastor Nancy and helping her. So I want to say uh, thank you to all you ministers and pastors. You really help the meetings, help them come up.